Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, let me start with the morning. This paper is written by someone who is working at a distance teaching university, so this will explain its bias. For distance teaching universities, the internationalization of their curricula has always been a complicated issue. We cannot simply send our students abroad because they have a family or a job or other obligations. And as is well known, the differences between distance teaching universities are tremendous, both in relation to the curricula uh, and the structure of their curricula, structure and size of the modules that are offered, teaching traditions and pedagogical orientation, traditions in assessment and assessment types, fees and all kinds of formal and legal infrastructure. Evidently, distance teaching universities have put much effort in solving these problems, and there have been several attempts to set up systems within which course change has become possible. However this may be, course change, however streamlined, streamlined remains a highly formal kind of undertaking which presumes bilateral agreements between the participating institutions covering assessment, study point transfer, language use, responsibilities for the students involved, etc., etc. Not surprisingly, within the Humanities Network of the European Association of Distance Teaching Universities, the question arose whether other types of international cooperation are possible. And clearly, raised the time honored kind of international cooperation which involves joint course production. But the very few projects which were actually carried out make clear that more often than not, the eventual product is not considered successful by the participants. The fact is that such projects are both time consuming and very expensive, while the eventual course, being a compromise with definition, is generally in poor harmony with the teaching systems and curricula of the participating institutions. In an attempt to find new ways for distance teaching universities to cooperate, which are less expensive, more flexible, and more informal, Trevor Herbert of the British Open University came with the idea of complementary course production. Essential to this concept is that there is no question of one common course at all. As a matter of fact, each participating institution makes its own course. What is common is only a specific theme. Crucial also is that the participating institutions offer the materials which are prepared for this course as open educational resources so that the partner institutions may freely use them. In addition, to further reduce cost and to increase flexibility, already existing open educational resources are made use of as much as possible. Put differently, complementary course production does not involve team-based cooperation at all. Complementary course production is, so to say, theme-based rather than team-based. This renders complementary course production its loosely structured character. It's highly flexible. The participating institutions only choose a common theme. Each institution makes its own complementary course, while crucially, the courses are completely based on open educational resources. That is, these courses are partly based on open educational resources, which are already available, whereas newly made courses materials are offered as OER, so that the partner institutions can freely use them. Essential to complementary course production is, so to say, content exchange, content in the form of OER. One of the crucial questions in this connection is, of course, to what extent existing open educational resources constitute natural building blocks for making new courses. More often than not, existing open education resources are not devised as building blocks for courses offered by other institutions. And the obvious and crucial question is then whether they can be used in this way. 
In this connection, three observations come to mind immediately. First, the number of existing open educational resources is enormous, whereas, as we all know, their quality differs. Second, in addition, in many cases, the context within which these materials were made is not made explicit. That is, are these materials part of an existing course, or are they produced as OER? Are the materials made for the general public, or are they part of an academic curriculum? Third, from the above, it directly follows that the existing open educational resources should nearly always be adapted to the system of the borrowing institution. Given the unclear origin of many open educational resources, the unavoidable and often radical adaptation of these materials should not be underestimated. In order to come to grips with the question uh, raised above, the Dutch Open University, that I'm a member of, has devised a pilot project, the aim of which was to answer the question whether existing open education resources constitute natural building blocks for course production. In order to keep the number of variable forces under control, we decided to concentrate on the materials offered by one institution, the OU UK. Specifically, in this pilot, we tried to find out to what an extent all the heritage materials offered by the British Open University on Open Learn can profitably be used for a bachelor course on heritage by the Open University of the Netherlands. The results of this pilot are as follows, and to a certain extent disappointing. There can be hardly any doubt that the value of the open educational resources offered by the OU UK as building blocks for complementary cost production is highly limited. That is, most of these materials are unfit to figure in the course offered by the Dutch Open University. The reasons for this are the following. The various materials offered by the OU UK differed considerably in nature. Some materials stem from academic courses, where others are contributions meant for a general public. To give an example, the course on Welsh history, specifically designed for open learn, was meant for the general public, whereas most other materials stem from existing bachelor courses, be it of different levels. The second reason, due to the lack of standards, the open educational resources offered by the OU UK differ considerably in terms of both size and setup. The size of the Welsh history course, for instance, is claimed to take at least 25 study hours, whereas the case study on Aberdulais Falls only takes two hours of study at best. Third, many of these materials are far too specific to be of any direct relevance for a course offered by another distance teaching university. However interesting these materials may be, for instance on Brighton Pavilion or Aberdulais Falls, in a Dutch bachelor course on heritage, they would make an awkward contribution. <coughs> From this it follows that the British materials, if chosen at all, should be completely adapted to a Dutch setting. In some cases, adapting these materials would even be meaningless. There is also a very general problem with these materials. For existing open education resources, it is unclear what is their actual status, particularly whether they are up to date or not. For instance, the OU UK course on Welsh history was paid for by money of the Hewlett Foundation. As such, this private sponsoring of courses in the humanities should be very much welcome, of course. But to the best of my knowledge, it's absolutely unclear who is responsible for the maintenance of the course. Who keeps this extensive course up to date? And how do we know whether it's up to date or not? The general conclusion seems to be the following. It seems to be the case that there is no general standard for open education resources, neither as to their size and format, nor as to their quality and up-to-dateness. As a consequence, <coughs> Even the open educational resources offered 
by one and the same institution differ considerably. From this it follows that the possibility to use these materials by another institution is limited. Clearly, this lack of standards is a very serious drawback as far as the possibility to reuse these materials is concerned, since it complicates the unavoidable adaptation process considerably. Let me stress that these are no isolated problems only specific to the materials presented by the British Open University on open learning. In my view, the outcome would be exactly the same if we would have focused on the materials presented by the Open uh, University of the Netherlands or my own faculty. The fact is that in the first stage <clears throat> of offering OER, we simply were not efficiently focused on the issue of the review, reuse of the materials presented. Clearly, the above remarks do not mean that the materials offered by the OU UK are uninteresting as such, nor do my remarks imply that the concept of complementary course production is ill-devised. For the general audience, these materials may be highly interesting. In addition, these materials may function as teasers to attract new students, meaning they may be an interesting marketing tool. As said, to use these materials in an academic setting as building blocks for a new academic course is a completely different issue. What these remarks imply for complementary course production is also clear. To avoid all kinds of problems and unnecessary adaptation, this process should be structured much more rigidly to become a fruitful way to make courses in an efficient manner. In addition, we should define standards. Before institutions embark on a project of complementary course production, the institutions should invest in determining the characteristics of the course that is envisaged and the open educational resources that will be offered and exchanged. That this complementary course production should start with a team-based first stage. A purely team-based approach seems to be far too loose. In this team-based stage, we should define the size and scope of the materials, the level it's aimed at, and we should make arrangements in relation to the question how the materials offered are kept up to date. Clearly, my rebuff remarks imply that the value of many existing open educational resources is far from clear as far as course production is concerned. <coughs> These materials may be relevant, but this may by no means be the case. What is more, the idea of a complete academic course based exclusively on existing OER seems to be highly doubtful. The outcome of the pilot suggests that complementary course production is most fruitful if it is preceded by an intensive team-based stage in which participating institutions make clear arrangements in relation to what each member has to produce. In general, the role of existing OER seems to be rather limited. It seems to be wise to concentrate on the exchange of materials which still have to be made. Thank you. I'd like to know if your conclusion that it, that it works very well through this team-based um, simultaneous creation and coordination of these materials, is that based on experience or is it just kind of a common sense conclusion based on what you've seen already? Well, at present we are working, let's say, uh, on a common course and we have uh, had this pilot and which was a bit uh, disappointing and now we try uh, to set up a new course in a new stage. So we have not uh, decided to uh, stop the whole project of complementary course production, but we have tried to learn from the failures in the past and we uh, try to uh, enter a new phase. Thank you. Like, um, what hope do you think there is for like, traditional universities which have begun offering uh, online distance learning to be able to collaborate together to create common classes and stuff? I mean, so if this is difficult for two, essentially distance universities to be able to collaborate and make a common resource? Like is it, would it even be possible for, much less so, for two traditional universities offering distance? Um, I do not exactly know what would be uh, the answer to my question, to my answer to this question. 
I mean, the problem with uh, distance teaching universities, particularly in relation to courses for a bachelor level, is that uh, these uh, courses uh, were uh, very detailed and, uh, in many cases, relatively large. So it's uh, many of these courses, there were, uh, was actually any tutoring system, uh, there were no teachers involved, or uh, only very few teachers. So the students should be able to uh, work uh, through these materials themselves. So that's the reason why uh, traditionally many of these courses were very, very expensive to uh, make, and that's why all kinds of um, distance teaching universities try uh, to uh, work together to reduce cost. Um, I do not know exactly what the role would be of uh, traditional universities because there, there are teachers and there are uh, meetings every week or two meetings every week or whatever. So it's a completely different uh, situation from a real, uh, let's say, traditional uh, distance teaching. Your conclusion um, that it was a disappointing experience, might that not be also uh, a driver for changing the development and production processes in the different <coughs> universities? Uh, because I think you, you're saying this was such a large a large uh, course, where if it, if it would have been smaller components that could be better reused, uh, I think a conclusion could also be that the other universities yeah. have to change their development and production process. I think this uh, is... Uh, uh, correct, but um, I stressed uh, this pilot uh, was related uh, to a course on bachelor level, and I think uh, a more flexible kind of system is much more easy uh, to uh, introduce at master level, where the courses need not be uh, that much detailed and where you can use all kinds of materials and students, students should be able to find their way in all these materials. But at bachelor level, this was aimed at the uh, bachelor level two, uh, then you, in many cases, particularly in the Dutch universities, uh, you still have um, uh, a need for a rather detailed uh, traditional kind of course. That was the general idea and that uh, was the background of our pilot. But in future we should really think of making other kinds of courses, of course. Okay, thank you. Thank you.